under the cover with Satan, your lover. Hugging your sins on the down low. Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love Online every Saturday at 12.15 PST, Pacific Time. <laughs> okay, so we are now getting ready to go to Joshua chapter 1. And I want you to go with me there. A lot of times, you know, we don't realize that we are literally under the covers with our other lover. In other words, with Satan, our other lover. Bottom line is, you know, sometimes we're shaking hands. Sometimes we are diametrically opposed to God's ways by our associations, our business contacts, our affiliations, our connections, our friendships, even our family members. And we don't realize how we have slidden back so far from God's ideal path that lays ahead of us, that we're somewhere on the other side of the planet. We're not just out of bounds. We're on the other side of the planet. So I want to share this with you because I believe it's an, it's an admonishment from the Lord to his people in particular, to everyone in general. And for those of you who are on the fence trying to decide God or me, his way or my way. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Joshua chapter seven. I love this story because it tells why some things go cuckoo in our lives. And we wonder what is going on, Alfie? What's it all about? Starting at verse one. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now, check it out. You notice that detail. Now, some people might consider it a minor detail. I consider it a major detail that God blamed the nation of Israel for the trespass of one individual. Check that out. So sometimes we wonder why things go crazy in our families. And we don't realize there's that one monkey in the bunch that's bringing curses on everybody. We wonder why our lives are, are unraveling because we're connected with that one somebody that we happen to be in love with that God said, no, 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 no. Touch not the unclean thing. And you're doing more than touching, baby. And we wonder why the church as a whole has so many weaknesses. Why the church is so powerless in so many ways, way too often than not. Now, moving on to verse two and I shall calm my little happy hips down. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethaven on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them saying, go up and view the country. And, men went, and the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, now, before I read this part, what they said, let me bring to your attention the arrogance. <laughs> I love it. Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but a few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. Whoops, there it is. What happened? Ha! Ah! Defeat. That's what happened. What brings about defeat? Sin. Mm. Five. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even 
unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Wow. Verse 6, and Joshua rent his clothes. Rent means he tore his clothes. Okay, he ripped them to shreds and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until even time. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, a lot. now I'm, I'm acting like Joshua now. So this is probably, if you can imagine like in a movie scene, the camera zooms in and putting dust on their heads and Joshua's rocking back and forth and wailing his arms in the air with tears running down his eyes. I'm just making it dramatic. That's what Hollywood does. So I can do it too. Okay. So he's making it dramatic. He's crying his eyes out and he's pleading with the Lord. <clears throat> <laughs> oh Lord God, wherefore hast thou always brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan. Oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? Oh boy, the Lord is like, give me a break. All right, this is verse, I'm trying to help you see the humor in it because that's what we do. <laughs> Listen, verse nine. Mm, mm, mm. For, uh, verse 10, sorry about that. And the Lord said unto Joshua, I'm going to say it with the attitude, get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them for they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Now, when he says Israel had sinned, he is, he is accusing the lot of them for the act of one individual man. See, Whatever we do affects our brothers and sisters. Whatever we do affects other people, no matter how much we want to say, it's none of your business what I do. You mind yours and I'll mind mine. But guess what? It is your business. God makes it your business. God makes it their business because everyone is affected by one person's chosen acts. So now let's keep reading because I want you to hear this. What happened? Verse 12. This is, this is the key word right here. Defeat. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, oh, up, oh, sanctify the people and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, this, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand. In other words, you ain't gonna stand before your enemies. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. I got to say, I got to stop here, y'all, for a second. Some of you are dealing with some crazy stuff going on in your life. You're living for God. You're committed to God. You're in the word. You're doing God's service. And you're wondering why. Why has this come upon me? Why? What is going on? Something, somewhere, somebody in your inner sanctum, so to speak, 
is dabbling in the accursed thing. And the sad part is it has an effect, a direct effect on your life as well. Even if you know nothing about it. Ain't that a trip? All right. Now, wow. Verse 13. Up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against the morrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh or chooses shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households. And the households which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire. He and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed transgressed, tra well, well, I'm saying it wrong, transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah and took the family of the Zarites and he brought the family of the Zarites man by man. And Zebdi was taken, and he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Who was the villain? Who was the bad guy? Who was the catalyst of all this cursed stuff going on? One man named Achan. One man. But what did God say? Israel had sinned. He didn't say Achan had sinned, did he? You better know what's going on behind your closed doors. You better know what's going on in your household, whether you're involved in it or not. If someone in your household is involved, if someone is bringing accursed things into your household, baby, it will affect everybody under that roof. It may even affect a lot of your relatives as well. This is crazy how this went down. See, a lot of times, you know, we think, you know, that's your business over there. I take care of me over here. You know, you mind yours. I mind mine. I, I handle my business. Just let me deal with it. But you ain't dealing with it. It's dealing with you. And you don't realize. See, I've heard stories in the past of, uh, I remember one pastor mentioned a member of his congregation where all of a sudden, uh, a, a daughter got sick and, and, and one of his sons got injured, horribly injured. I forgot what the reason was, but it just seemed like a domino effect. The dominoes were falling on everybody in his household. And he was wondering what is going on? I'm living a, I'm living a life for the Lord. I'm not out there dabbling in sin. I'm, I'm not doing this. I'm not, my wife isn't doing this. What is going on? Here's what went wrong. One of the kids, one of the kids now, he knew nothing about it, had started dabbling with their friends down the street. I'm just making it up because I don't remember the details, but the one thing I do remember is that they were dabbling. The kid was dabbling in some form of witchcraft, and he wasn't doing it aiming at harming his family, he was doing it for fun. Like some of you who play with the Ouija board, like some of you who call the psychic hotlines just to see what they're going to say about who your next girlfriend or who your next boyfriend's going to be, who you're going to marry, how many kids you're going to have, how much money you're going to make. See, you think it's harmless fun, but it's not. You wonder why there's so much demonic activity in this world. Because we have voluntarily or involuntarily or been associated or affiliated with someone who voluntarily has opened the door to demonic activity. Hence, 
you get mess on you too. Mm. All right. Let's go on. I love this story because a lot of times people wonder why the bad things happen to good people. Here's a perfect reason. Joshua was living for the Lord. Think about that. The other tribes weren't trying to sin against God. They were fighting God's war. They were on the front lines doing their thing for their, for their master, for their God of the universe. But one man, one little stinking, thinking, poop butt of a man decides to do something stupid. And he caused a lot of men their lives. And he caused a lot of people havoc. Why? Because he did it. Not because they all did it in agreement. He. He did it on the down low. It was a clandestine or clandestine operation done by one man. It was in secret. It was undercover. Cloak and dagger style. Nobody knew but him. He hid it amongst his stuff. Hid it. He didn't show it and, and blare it out to all his family members and brag about it. No, he hid the stuff. But God brought it to the surface, didn't he? See, you got to be careful in your life. When you're walking, especially those of you walking with the Lord, those of you who are not I feel sorry for you because it's better to have a messed up life in God's hands than to have it without God's help. Because I'm telling you, life is already hard, but God makes it so much easier. And if you're living for him, oh my goodness, all the beautiful interventions he will bring into your life. All the help is right there, readily available. But for those of you who are living both sides against the middle, those of you who are straddling the fence, who are undercover with, with your lover, or you're shaking hands with you know who, or you're, you're doing deals or your little underhanded things, uh, you're, you're under the sheets with somebody you have no business being under the sheets with. You've got all these little hidden sins. You're smiling at your pastor, but you hate him. In your mind, you're picturing how you could just tear him apart. You're smiling at your choir director or at the usher or at the at the auxiliary uh, leader. And you can't stand them. You hate when they come in the room. Oh, here they come again. You may not tell a soul, but God sees it. So it's not always, it's not always the things that you hide, that you bring in physical things that you hide. It's also those thoughts and feelings in your heart that are on so far on the down low, nobody can see it past that masquerade mask of yours. And while you're walking around living up to that song, smiling faces, sometimes pretend to be your friend, smiling faces, show no traces, of the evil that lurks within. But God sees the evil that lurks within and he will judge it. Don't think he's going to leave that be. Don't think he's going to wink at it because he's not. If he brings it to your attention and you don't do anything about it, baby, you're going to be the one to pay the piper. You might be scheming and conniving and doing all kind of stuff, trying to trap somebody in a trick bag that will bring them down and out. But you will be caught in that trick bag that you're laying out for them. You will be caught in a trap you set for someone else. You will be caught in your little schemes. Because the very thing you're trying to do, steal from someone else's hard work and you're going to get the glory. And you're going to take it over. And it's going to be yours one day, soon as they die. Just go on, hurry up and die. God knows what's in your heart. God knows what you're hoping for. God knows what you're thinking against that person. Whether they're right or wrong, the bottom line is God knows what's in your heart, baby. That's what you have to answer to. So a lot of people come to church 
and they want to raise unholy hands. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And other folks walking around, oh, praise the living God. Oh, he's so wonderful. God is so good. God is good. All the time and all the time, God is good. And you quote all of these church cliches and you're going through all of these church service calisthenics. You stand up for the reading of the word of God. But when you're at home and you got the Bible in your hand and you're reading it, you're not standing up, are you? Because it's not necessary. That is a human... That is a human, a man-made tradition. So what I'm trying to say to you is all the little facades, all the phoniness, all the little hidden sins that you think don't matter. You told a little white lie over there. And you did a little scheming over here. And you told, you showed somebody else somebody's dirty underwear, told their business so you could get a good laugh off of it. So you can make sure you pull them off their pedestal because everybody looks up to them and you don't know that in your heart you are jealous. So you make sure nobody looks up to them because you're going to tell everybody who they really are because you know their business. And you're going to bring them down, baby. God sees why you're doing it. Not only what you do, he sees why. So all these little hidden sins, let me tell you, some of your sins are so well hidden, you don't even know about it. Ask me how I know. I've been there. I've done that. And I heard the Holy Spirit tell me, you are jealous of her. And I didn't even know it. But let me tell you, baby, when the Lord tells you something about yourself, you better agree with it. You better change your heart real quick. Lord, help me. I didn't realize that was there. Please forgive me. Have mercy on me. Help me, Lord, to change that attitude. And what I did to make sure that I didn't deal with that ever again was instead of keeping that on the down low, I stood up in church and exposed it to the whole congregation. And I said, because I was determined to get the victory over that one. The Lord just showed me a few minutes ago that I am jealous of sister so-and-so. Sister so-and-so, I apologize. I know it was a hidden sin, but I'm exposing it because I don't ever want the devil to have a secret place in my heart where he can hide anywhere. Any chance I get I will expose him at my own expense. But I'm getting over this. And I ask you to forgive me. And I hope and pray I never get jealous of anybody else again. And as soon as I get a whiff of jealousy in my spirit, help me, Lord, to go to you and clean that crap out of me. How, what is your attitude to those little hidden sins? What is your attitude to those little hidden attitudes? I mean, those little hidden feelings that you have. Sorry for being redundant. What are those? How, how do you deal with it? Do you just brush it up under the carpet, ignore it, turn a blind eye to it, and hope one day it will just dissipate up in thin air? No, baby, if you don't deal with it, God's going to deal with it. It's better for you to deal with it because the Bible says it is better if you confess your sins, God says, I will cover your sins. But if you hide your sins, God says, I will expose them. So which way do you want to play that? Think about that one. And get with the Lord. Get on his good side now. Do it his way. At your own expense. Don't worry about what people think about you. The only thing you have to worry about is what does God? He See, he ain't going to think about you what he knows about you. What does God see in me? What does God know about me that I don't even know? I constantly ask God to show me my heart. Show me if there be any wicked way in me. Because when the rapture comes, baby, I don't want to be sitting up here on my hind 
parts crying the blues about, Lord, why, why didn't you take me? No, I want to know now. So I don't want any weight or sin weighing me down so much that I can't even go up when he calls his church up. I don't want to miss out for any reason, for any purpose, for, for any level of pride, for my little self-image, for my reputation. I don't care. I know how imperfect I am, but I don't know quite how imperfect because I will never know me like God knows me. And you will never know you like God knows you. Ask God to show you the hidden sins. Ask God to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Uh, uh, let me share what God's attitude is to those who refuse to deal with their hidden sins. And we are going, and by the way, the battle of Ai was lost in chapter seven. But once God dealt with Achan and got rid of the accursed thing, and Achan and his family died, guess what happened? I mean, because God, you know, you know, took them down with some fire. Listen to this. Ver chapter eight, Joshua chapter eight. When they went to fight the exact same battle with the exact same people, bam, victory, just like that. See, disobedience and sin brings defeat. Obedience and righteousness brings victory every time. So let's go to Isaiah chapter one. And I want you to hear, and then we're going to close. We're not going to go on long with this. Isaiah chapter one. I want you to hear how God feels when he sees his people congregating together to come and worship before the Lord. <laughs> okay, let's go to it. <clears throat> Whew, starting at verse 10. This is Isaiah chapter one. Starting at verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Now, if I put that in my words and I was bawling somebody out, I'd be like, what are you doing all that for me for? What's all that about? All right. The, I am, that, that saith the Lord, he's the one talking. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. Now, in other words, what he is saying, I am up to here. I am fed up. I've had enough. Don't do any more. This is sickening to me. All right. Now let's go to the next one. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? In other words, who told you to come by my house? Who told you to come visit me? I didn't invite you. So who told you to, to come here? Huh? Who? All right. I'm just putting a little drama in it so you get the feel of his attitude. All right. <laughs> wow. 13, bring no more vain oblation. Vain is useless, is worthless, is nonsense. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. In other words, it's like off with you now, just go. Just get out of my face. I'm sick of this crap. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. Have you ever heard your parents say, oh, I'm sick and tired of your mess? All right. 15. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. 
Why? Your hands are full of blood. 16. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now I just stopped at verse 20. That's something. That's heavy right there. That's heavy. I mean, to think of how God feels when a lot of us enter into his courts with praise and enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with singing praises and hallelujahs and glory to God and waving our hands and, and, and going through all these church calisthenics thinking that God is hearing us. You know, <clears throat> let me say this real quick. Years ago, I'm giving you an example of how we're blah, 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 but we're not talking to God. We think we're praying, but we're not. There was a woman whose hair I used to do. And I liked her as a person, but I knew that every time she came, it was going to be a monologue from beginning to end. A monologue in which I could interject, oh yeah, oh really? Hmm. Oh, that's about all I was going to get into it. So once she sat in the chair and I got the drape on her, the, the, the engine started warming up. And next thing, how's this one? How's that one? What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. After that, it was on and cracking, baby. Blah, 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 blah. And I did this and we did and that, 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 and that, that. And monologue, baby, monologue. Trust me, I knew, even in my spirit, I knew. She's not talking to me. This is nervous energy. And she has to fill every second with sound or her spirit is restless. You hear what I'm saying? This is not a, a pat and so-and-so conversation. This is a monologue because for some people, the monologue is like a sedative. The monologue is like a shot of liquor. The monologue is like a, sh a shot in the arm. But you're not really connecting and talking, pouring your heart out to God. You're giving a monologue because for you, it's a high, but it's also a good luck charm. The more I talk to him, the better it's going to be for me. Mm -hmm. I stay on his good side because you think that with all that ex excess chatter, you are winning him over. But what he is saying is, whatever you bring to me, whether it be monologue, offering, sacrifice, whatever it is, baby cakes, it's a stench to me. It's a trouble to my soul to have to deal with you because what's coming out of your mouth is totally different from what I'm getting from your heart. And what's in your heart stinks. What's in your heart is rotten. What's in your heart is a putrefying, runny soul. There's something wrong in there and you're not dealing with it. You're talking over it. You got your little masquerade, your little costume, and your, and your little painted smile on your face. But underneath, dead man's bones. And you think that I am blind and I can't see it. You forget I am God. I know all. Pat talker now. I say all that to say, we need to mend our ways. It's time for true repentance, y'all. It's time to come clean with ourselves and with God. Sometimes the reason you can't come clean with God is because you won't come clean with yourself. Why won't you? You're in denial. Your pride won't allow you to admit the role you played in creating the mess you're in.
You got excuses coming out the wazoo about all of your can't help it and why this is falling apart and why these sins keep recurring in your life. You got all the excuses, but you're not leaning on God. See, when you lean on God, he sustains your weight. But if you're never leaning on God, then that means you're leaning on yourself. You're sustaining your own weight and you're not doing a good job of it because you are literally collapsing under your own load. It's too heavy for you. You can't bear it by yourself. That's why Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You are so restless, half of you out there, that you fill your life with chatter, busyness, sins, all kind of nonsense, all kind of sinful entertainment, all kind of internet entertainment. You got your hand on the keys with one hand and your other hand, I won't say where that is on the other, but it's working it, baby. Why? Because there's an emptiness inside. There's a void and you're trying to fill it with nonsense. Just like the Israelites started getting involved in the other country's idols and they started building these idols and getting involved with witchcraft and, 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 and soothsaying and all kind of nonsense. It's fascinating, but fascination does not mean right. All these lifestyles of what the Bible refers to as strange flesh. Look that up. You'll figure out what it is. Strange flesh, baby. And nowadays they want to say, we're living in a new time. That should all be acceptable. And we're going to shove it down society's throat until everybody's accepted at the same level. But what does God say? I'm sick of it. I'm full of it. Full of your crap. Away with it. Get it out of my face. But see, you want to think that God is so loving that he'll tolerate everything that you want to bring to the table, baby. And to God, it's gag time. He is not having a good time with this. So what I say is, we know there are trouble times coming. We know that. My question to you is, are you going to be under the arc of safety, doing it God's way, or are you going to be out there exposed to the elements, being whipped to the lift, to the left and whipped to the right? Huh? What is your life going to be full of? Victory or defeat? Blessing or cursing? As I beg you to take a second look, reconsider. For those of you who have not done so, ask God to forgive you for your sins and ask Jesus into your heart and ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit because that is the only power that will enable you to live the life God requires of you. But he does give you that help now, doesn't he? So you're not doing it on your own. And for those of you who know you're backsliding, you know you're, so, you're backslidden so far that even the sins that used to make you cry three years ago, they don't even affect you now. You just take it for granted. Oh, Lord, forgive me. I'll be all right. But you're not really repenting. See, repentance is not the apology. Forgive me, Lord. That's not repentance. Repentance is what you do after you apologize. And I leave you with that one. God bless you. God keep you. God have mercy on you and me, on all of us, because we all have to be careful not to slip slide away. Amen? And definitely not to backslide into oblivion. God bless you. Amen. I'm done.